So I like to begin my parachute courses with a pretty quick history of parachuting. I think it's good to see the evolution of the parachute and to also realize how long or not so long ram air parachutes have been around for. Like I said, this is just gonna be a quick overview. So I'm not gonna be talking about every historical person that's out there. And just a word of warning, not everybody agrees on exactly when things happened or who was the first to do something. Um, so I will be linking a bunch of the resources that I used in the description section. So if you'd like to dig in and read more about a particular person, you're more than welcome to do so. So with that, let's begin. So we're gonna begin in 1485 with a sketch that Leonardo da Vinci had uh, put down in one of his books. And as far as we know, nobody at the time had ever jumped it. He had just made this sketch. But in June of 2000, a British um, jumper decided that he was going to jump that Leonardo da Vinci design, and it turns out that it did actually work. A hundred years after this, there was a Croatian who also made a sketch in one of his books, The Machine Nove, and it shows a rectangular design for a parachute. And it's actually very similar to um, what we're currently jumping as skydivers. Perhaps he jumped from a bell tower with it, but there's no conclusive evidence that it actually did happen. So did he or did he not jump it? We don't really know. So now we're going to go forward about 200 years to a man that we know did jump off of a tower in Montpellier, France. He had a 14-foot parachute that had a rigid wooden frame, and I believe it was linen that was draped over it. So he had some animals that he's uh, test dummies before he actually took the leap, but he thought that perhaps this could be used by people as a portable fire escape. He's also the person that gave us the term parachute, and that comes from Greek uh, para, meaning against, and then the French shoot, meaning fall. So parachute means against the fall. A little bit after this, in the 1790s, we start to see that parachutes are beginning to be made from silk instead of the aforementioned linen, because silk is stronger and it's lighter weight. At the end of the 1700s, we have another Frenchman who comes up with this design, where it's actually a parachute that folds up. So everything previously has been these rigid frames that they put um, the material over. So here he's got a foldable version. So, kind of folds up like an umbrella. He's got a basket underneath that he can ride up in. So he tethers this to a hot air balloon that takes him up to altitude and he's jumping anywhere from 3,000 to 8,000 feet. He then severs the connection and comes down under the parachute. He finds that he has very little control over it and it oscillates wildly. So he's the first person to figure out that if you cut a vent into these round parachutes, it helps to reduce the oscillations. In 1887, so almost 100 years later, we have Captain Thomas Baldwin. He's the person who's credited with the invention of the parachute harness. He's also the person that makes what is called the first limp parachute jump. So even that foldable umbrella style one that we just saw, it actually had some rigid channels in it. This did not have those, and so that's why it was considered a limp parachute. So around this time, people are still jumping um, for reasons of just for it to be a spectacle, essentially. So they go to fairs, they go to exhibitions, either jumping off of buildings or they're jumping out of balloons just to entertain a crowd. And these two are no exception. We've got some German exhibition jumpers here. But what is interesting is that uh, this is the time that people actually start to fold up the parachute so that they could be worn on the back. In this case, they said that we could worn in a knapsack. In 1906, we have the American, Charles Broadwick, whom he calls it the coat pack. So you can see, once again, it's being worn on the back. And he's also the person who's credited with inventing the static line. In 1912, we have another Army captain, Albert Berry. Uh, he makes the first jump from an airplane near St. Louis after he dangles underneath from a trapeze bar. To put this into perspective, the Wright brothers, they made their first flight in December of 1903. So this is less than a decade later after that first flight that we're now actually just jumping from planes. And the following year, the first female jumps from a plane. So this is Georgia Tiny Broadwick. Um, she actually, at around the age of 15, went to one of the exhibitions put on by Charles Broadwick and was just fascinated by parachutes, apparently, and convinces him to let her get in onto jumping them. 
So at some point he actually adopts her and that's why they share the same last name. But like I said, she was the first female to jump from a plane and later she's the first person to uh, free fall while doing some demo jumps for the US Army. So they were trying to demonstrate their coat pack in the static line. And on her fourth demo jump, her static line becomes entangled with the airplane's tail assembly and she's not able to get back into the plane. She doesn't panic though. She decides that she's going to cut that static line to a shorter length and leaves the airplane and then pulls uh, that static line or the shortened static line by hand to open her parachute. So that's essentially the first free fall descent of at least a little bit and a demonstration of what would later be called a ripcord. So the US Army after this demonstration, they decide that they're gonna purchase two of these coat packs to test. Um, and now we are at the beginning of World War I. But the Army was hesitant to give them to the pilots because they thought that they might then abandon their machines needlessly. And pilots were actually really hesitant when it came to parachutes as well because they thought it would show a lack of trust in their flying machine and also a lack of trust in their piloting ability. But the people that did get parachutes were these observation balloonists. So World War I, all about trench warfare. And here's an example of an, one of the observation balloons that uh, they would send up so they could spy on what the enemy was doing. But the problem was that these observation balloons also made for very good targets for the enemy. So there were 35 different uh, American balloon companies in France, and it was uh, reported that 116 jumps were actually made from these balloons. The parachutes always opened the way they should, but unfortunately that didn't necessarily mean that the soldier actually made it down to the ground alive. Also supposedly towards the end of World War I, Churchill reportedly muses on the idea of using airborne soldiers that you could then put behind enemy lines to try to finally end this war. At the very end of the war, Germans actually started giving their pilots parachutes that weighed about 30 pounds, the entire assembly, because they could no longer really afford to lose any more of their pilots. After World War I, uh, the Army decides that they do want to try to test these parachutes, so they kind of came up with their list, wish list. They want something that could be worn on the back. They want something that was going to have um, a ripcord, I believe. And so Leslie Irvin, who was part of the Army Air Service's parachute research team, he volunteers to make the first freefall parachute skydive over near Dayton, Ohio, using what they came up with, the Airplane Freefall Parachute Type A. After he does this, he then forms his Irving Air Chute Company, and so he's the first person to have a parachute designer and manufacturer in the United States. Also in this year, an Italian named Pino is credited with inventing the first pilot chute. So in the early 1930s, uh, we start to see some infantry airborne uh, groups being put together, and it's actually kind of led by the Soviets. They had, in 1933, a peacetime trial where they sent up 62 paratroopers to jump. And throughout the 30s, you start to see, like, Japan, Germany, and Italy kind of following along the Soviets' example. And finally, then you also have France, um, the United States, and Great Britain that also decide that they need to start putting together these airborne troops. So in 1939, we've got the beginning of World War II, and it was actually Germany uh, that has the first combat jump when they send paratroopers into Denmark. In June 1940, the U.S. Army Parachute Test Platoon is formed, made up of about 48 volunteers, and they make their first military jump at Fort Benning, Georgia. It is considered so risky that they would not allow any volunteers to be married men. In August 1942, the Army's 82nd Airborne Division is the first in U.S. history, and I think as we know, there were a whole lot of jumps that were made during World War II. In June 1942, we have um, a parachute that is tested by Adeline Gray, made of nylon, first time that nylon is used. She was a parachute rigger and tester, and the reason that we started making parachutes from or wanted to make parachutes from nylon is because most of our silk is actually coming in by way of Japan and clearly we're not on good terms with Japan right now in the middle of World War II. So DuPont works with the Pioneer Parachute Company to make this nylon parachute that she ends up jumping. In 1946, so this is now after World War II, you've got a lot of people that are coming back from the war that have, have made jumps and they wanna continue jumping. And so we have this group of people coming together uh, approximately 100 members when it first begins, and they call themselves the National Parachute Jumpers and Riggers. In 
1957, this name is gonna to change to the Parachute Club of America, and in 1967, we get what we have now, the United States Parachute Association, or USPA. So in the 1950s, there's a lot of military surplus that's available and for cheap. They found that they were able to modify them with a little bit of work to make them steerable. And eventually they come up with this idea of adding a sleeve just to make the opening shock tolerable. So jumping starts to take off a bit. So let's pause for a moment to look at uh, the similarities of the round parachute system at this point with what we currently jump. So what have we got in common between these two? Well, they're wearing a harness now. The main parachute is folded up and it's being worn on the back. We've got two sets of risers that lead to lines and they've got steering toggles. And it can be deployed by static lines or pilot chutes. So now that we've talked about similarities, let's talk about the differences. So at this point, the reserve parachute is most likely being worn in front of the person. They've got a cape well system for releasing risers, so not nearly as easy as our three ring system, but due to the emergency procedures that they use on a round parachute, um, this system is, does just well. The pilot chutes are go typically going to be spring loaded. And when I say that they've got steering toggles, their idea of steering a round parachute, it's more um, along the lines of pivoting instead of the, the turning that we're used to with our ram hairs. In the 1960s, we have Stephen Perry. He begins work on his Stevens cutaway system that's later gonna be called the RSL. And the pair commander, as you can see here being advertised, is considered the high performance parachute of the day. Had a large glide ratio and pretty soft landing. So in the 60s, pair commander dominated. In 1964, though, we have this Canadian who was a kite maker actually living in the United States, and he comes up with the idea, essentially, of the Ram Air parafoil, and this is his patent here. So what does it mean for something to be Ram Air? If you look at figure two, it's looking at the side, the profile of the parafoil that he designed, and you can see that he used what we call a top skin and a bottom skin. So two pieces of fabric that meet together, they're, they're sewn together in the back, but in the front, we've got the inlets that allows air to be pushed into the parachute to inflate it while it's flying. Uh, and those are the cells that we think about in the nose of our parachute. So once we get into the 70s, quite a few things start to happen, right? So we have uh, this guy, Greg, who invents the square slider because one of the things that they found when they jumped that parafoil that the Canadian came up with is that the openings were super hard. So he comes up with the square slider, helps to slow down the openings so that they're also tolerable. In 1974, Bill Booth gives us the throwout pilot chute. In 1976, he also gives us the three rings. In 1979, we see the introduction of F111 fabric that is coming to the market. And in 1980s, both Ted Strong and Bill Booth were working on trying to make tandem skydiving a thing. In the 1990s, canopy, canopy piloting appears as a sport. In 1991, we have Cyprus appears on the scene. This is the first electronic AAD. Before that, they had been um, mechanical. And I'm going to finish up with just saying that in 2006, the first world championships in canopy piloting takes place. So you can see that a whole lot happened from the 70s and on once we started having the Ram Air parachutes. And really, I think it was uh, World War II, where you had so many of the soldiers coming back from World War II that wanted to keep jumping, and that's when uh, skydiving kind of took off as a sport. So I hope you enjoyed the history of parachuting. Um, I'm going to put a lot of links down below in case you want to dig into more of the details.